sort of stumbled into the center for fiction, we were completely blown away by just how amazing this place was. Uh, the stacks of books, the way that they engaged with the local population, and both Suraj and I just felt it was very important for us to be here uh, and bring JLF for the first time uh, to Brooklyn. So we are absolutely delighted to partner with Melanie and her colleagues at Center for Fiction, and we do hope that over the years, uh, this particular room swells with the numbers of people from in and around this particular place. Uh, our, our primary effort in New York has been not necessarily, you come to us, but can we bring some amazing work to you? And it's really in that context that uh, we, just, we thought that it would be uh, wonderful to get Martin, for those of you who don't know, uh, The Written World is a book that should be in every one of your libraries. I've known Martin for some time, he's been coming out to the Jaipur Literature Festival, but this book opens your eyes and your mind uh, to what we think we know, the power of the word or the power of literature. But when you read this, you actually realize how much of the world that we know today has been shaped by words. So Martin, over to you to do a quick presentation and take us through 3,000 years of history <laughs> of the written word and then we'll have a conversation and open it up for questions. Good. Thanks so much and thanks for having me. I used to live around here before this wonderful place emerged. Just, I think I left in 2018. So it's great to be back and, and, and to, to see, see what happened uh, 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 in, in my absence. Um, so, you know, this project and the ones following, including culture, uh, uh, that was just mentioned, really started with a dilemma. So about 15 years ago, I, um, I, I sort of stumbled into the job of editing a huge world literature anthology, the Norton Anthology of World Literature, that was to go from the beginning of writing all the way to the present in like six volumes. And I thought, you know, with a large team of people, and we all totally freak out because I think each of us thought that, oh yeah, we are well read, you know, we've read all kinds of literature and being confronted with, with, with those sort of 4,000 years of literature, we just realized how, how much literature existed, how little we knew. And so we and I started to sort of go back to the basics. I read a lot of books on world history and, you know, that's sort of an established genre. There are sort of more popular ones and more scholarly ones. And then I, was looking for similar books of world literature and realized that in, in, for some reason, and I have some thoughts about that, they just didn't exist. And so, you know, my team and I, we just, over many years of putting together that anthology, we started to create that bigger picture and we realized that it was only once we've created that bigger picture that we could ask and answer some of the most fundamental questions about literature, such as why, was, why and when was writing first invention, invented? How often was writing invented? I had no idea how even to answer that question. My answer is, by the way, at least twice, uh, and that itself is an interesting story. Um, what is the big shape of literary history in different parts of the world? And, and, um, and what's the role of technology since we were all, uh, you know, writing and reading and think about literature in the context of a media revolution? So, so in some sense, that work with that wonderful team of people, and it's an ongoing effort, uh, first sort of put me in that position of having, developing sort of a bird's eye view of literature and and look at some of these broader patterns. And, and so I tried to, my first attempt to, to describe that uh, is this book. And then basically I've been working on this project on that perspective ever since. How these two stories yeah. uh, came about, because they were really two parts of the world. But before that, so what comes first? Art, right? Well, uh, unfortunately, no. Um, writing was invented in Mesopotamia about 5,000 years ago. So this was the beginning of urban civilizations, the first cities in southern Iraq. Um, and because of that urbanization, that concentration of people, 
there were more and more complex economic transactions. And that's really when writing was invented, to keep track of these economic transactions. So in some sense, writing was invented by accountants. And, and it was- Wall Street always uh, It's, it's yeah. sad, uh, but it's true. And then only hundreds of years later, sort of as a byproduct, people started to write down stories. So yeah, that was a big surprise for me. And the, and the inventing of the writing and the two different stories yeah. you alluded to? So, so that's, you know, and then you can start, so this is the first earliest full existing alphabet in Mesopotamia, uh, cuneiform, uh, written on clay tablets in what's today southern Iraq. And then there are, of course, other early writing cultures, Egypt, you know, India, Greece, China, but they're all on, you know, they're all connected on the European and Asian, on, on the Eurasian continent. So it's, it's, possible, it's possible that some of these inventions were independent inventions, but it's also possible that they sort of traveled by idea transfer from the writing system themselves are quite different, uh, uh, but that the idea of writing uh, uh, was invented only once in Mesopotamia. So that, that's, that was the question. Was this just sort of this one time fluke, some crazy accountant coming up with this idea and you know changing the history of the world uh, um, but then the interesting thing is that there is one you know certain second invention and that's in the Americas that's the Maya the, 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 the Maya culture that there was relatively little writing in the Americas before the arrivals of the Spaniards, but there was the Mayan and, and Mesoamerica in general, several writing traditions there. There was a kind of writing in, in, in Peru, and, and the Aztecs had sort of picture books and a kind of picture writing. So there were various writing traditions, but the, the, the only full-blown Alphabet really came out of the the Mayan tradition, and there there are hundred there there are one thousand five hundred years of Maya literature, and it's a fascinating. It's almost like a control experiment where you can say, okay, now we actually have a second and in completely independent invention of writing, and we can observe how how literary history preceded prior to the connecting of these two writing cultures, and so I just find that fascinating in the Maya tradition, including the great epic Popol Vuh, which itself has a fascinating history, uh, I think is completely understudied and under, known only by experts for the most part. Uh, but it's the, the only definitely authentically you know, independent writing tradition. And, and that I, is, is and kind what, of cool. What was amazing in your book is to see that the, the way that the Mayan culture, the writing came to us is again by somebody who conquered right. and, and decided then to write up uh, or yes. translate this and then use the translation later yes. uh, to sort of subjugate the people. But tell us about yeah, the yeah. story. Well, of course, that contact, as you know, I think everyone here knows, was maximally destructive. The Spaniards, they arrive, uh, uh, they... Uh, With chicken pox. Well, upon, upon other things, right. Mm -hmm. they, they arrive as conquerors, but they also bring inadvertently uh, for the most part, uh, right, diseases against which the populations of the Americas are not immune. But that's not the only destruction. They are also very, you know, there is yeah. their deliberate acts. And so, though they're Christians, so they do want to preserve souls. They want to convert. Uh, but then they realize that that. Mayans, Mayans uh, stick to, in some sense, they convert to Christianity, but, but because but they hold on to their old gods at the same time in a polytheistic world, that's not a problem. Uh, and so the Spaniards realize that, that they they convince themselves that they have to eradicate uh, my culture by the root, and the root in their mind, and maybe rightly so is the Maya writing culture. So they try to round up all the books, destroy all the books, and basically... They did this huge bonfire. Uh, this huge bonfire. Where all the books are brought yeah. in and burnt. And yeah. some people sort of hide the books underground, yeah. but most of them are. Exactly. It's, it's, an, it's a massive act of cultural sabotage and destruction. And the only reason why this great text, the Popol Vuh, 
survives. And I find it, it, it's an incredibly moving and amazing story, is that these three anonymous Maya scribes, they realize that their culture is under assault, that they realize that it will be eradicated. They realize that their writing system will disappear and become illegible. So what they do is they write down the text, the council book, their sacred text, the Popol Vuh, in the alphabet of the victors grudgingly, but realizing that that's the only way this text will survive, and they hide this book. And this is how the Popol Vuh survives, by the savvy of these, you know, of these anonymous scribes. Uh, um, and it's only really over the course of the 20th century that the Mayan glyphs are sort of rediscovered and, 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 and deciphered again. And the first scribe was Moses? <laughs> well, it's, you know, according to the Hebrew Bible, he, uh, he's the first scribe. Uh, he's because God wrote the first few tablets, and, you know. <laughs> right. But, well, that's the scene on, on Mount Sinai, the, the writing of the Ten Commandments. It's a fascinating, fascinating scene. I mean, I must have, you know, heard... Not the Cecil de Mille <laughs> scene, but this is the, maybe... I mean, it's a, it's a crazy scene because first Moses writes the Ten Commandments himself with his hand on stone. And then, you know, it's the famous scene where he dance around the golden calf, he gets angry, breaks the tablets. And then Moses, and then we have the second writing of the Ten Commandments, and now it's Moses who writes, taking dictation from God. It's a, it's a very odd sort of double writing, and then Moses is seen as, as the, the author of the, uh, the five books of Moses, as they are called, though, you know, that, that's a historical fiction, that's a backdating of, uh, of, of that, but that writing scene is, is fascinating, yeah. And the scribes, you know, the way that you tell your story, scribes through the ages, are the ones who hold the power. Yes. Because they can uh, uh, write what, yeah. what, what their kings or their emperors are saying, but they can also divine and in many ways dictate yes. uh, uh, what their kings and yes. emperors could or should yes. have been saying. It's very true and that divination uh, is very... Sort of Biden's speech writer type of <laughs> Exactly. No, I think that's true. You know, my, there's this amazing story uh, that Mesopotamian scribes, the ones who invented writing, these accountant scribes, wrote, you know, told themselves and wrote down about the invention of writing, and it's a, it's a really fascinating and very telling story. It, it, it takes place in Uruk, there's a king of Uruk. Uruk is the first city. It's the place where the, the first, uh, uh, where the first longer text of literature, the Epic of Gilgamesh, is set. King Gilgamesh is the king of Uruk. Actually, a year ago, I was finally able to go to Uruk in southern Iraq, and it was fascinating to see, among other things. But this is sort of a sidebar. Uh, the 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 Epic of Gilgamesh is, to my mind, I've become more and more convinced of it, uh, a key to understanding climate change because it records deforestation, which is is the comes goes hand in hand with the first city building and and that's when we get the story of the flood and the whole sort of apocalyptic imaginary of, of climate change but in any case uh, uh, so the story is set in Uruk and it features a king of Uruk who wants to conquer the mountain realm of Arata and so the king of Uruk sends a, a, a messenger into the mountains demanding you know allegiance of the king of uh, uh, the mountain king uh, and, and but the mountain king is not impressed sends the messenger back with a taunt and refuses to submit and so the back and forth it goes this diplomatic standoff the messenger runs back and forth and finally when he returns one more time with you know with a negative reply that this mountain realm is still you know not ready to pledge allegiance, the king of Uruk gets incredibly Sense. mad and lets out this rant. And the scribe, said, or not the scribe, the messenger the standing next to him panics because he can't remember this long rant. And it's at this moment in the story that the king takes some clay and puts his words 
to clay, gives the clay tablet to the messenger. The messenger runs one more time up into the mountains, shows the king uh, of the mountain realm this message, and the mountain king doesn't understand how it's possible that words could be on this piece of clay, and then in front of the whole court is so impressed by this piece, you know, this handheld piece of technology that he submits. And so that's the, that's the story these scribes themselves told about this invention. And you can tell it's about power. It's about you know, expanding the, the city-states from one place to the next. And it has nothing to do with literature. It's about empire, if you will. No. You know, what's, what's been fascinating, again, is that through history or through millennia, uh, the story of the flood, I mean, the Gilgamesh story of the flood, gets repeated, whether it's in yeah. the Noah's Ark, whether it's in the Indian yeah. uh, traditional uh, uh, myth-telling stories. So w is it that all of these people received inspiration from each other? Did the stories travel? Or were they all separately telling this one big story of the planet and the Great Flood? You know, that's a great question. and I. I'm not sure. I think there are flood stories in many different traditions. What's amazing is that this particular flood story that appears first in Gilgamesh and then in the Hebrew Bible and then you know in the Old Testament and then the, in the Quran is clearly the same story. So it's very clear. It you know it has the Noah character in the in the Epic of Gilgamesh. It's Utnapishtim, who is the only one who understands what's going to happen. There's a sense of punishment that humans have sinned and they're going to be punished by this flood. But the one savvy or righteous person is going to save us. Uh, and so it's all the details are the same. So that that one flood story certainly spread and became incredibly influential and there, there are theories that this may be based on the historical event when the the Mediterranean Sea connected with the with the Black Sea and so that that was sort of a a, a sudden flooding of the Near East, and that's why that's where the story of the flood sort of originates. And you didn't, you didn't find any such evidence in the Americas of a similar story, either in the Mayan culture or in uh, uh, the First Nation uh, Americans. So I, I don't. Not in that form. There are stories of flooding. So there's the as you know the Aztecs live in Tenochtitlan, uh, which is uh, Mexico City, which is in the middle of a lake. And there are stories of flooding, but that's a very different uh, uh, situation. It's because it has to do with water management and canals. It's an incredibly complicated ecosystem. How that how that uh, 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 world. Uh, uh, Works and and there's they they built a new uh, uh, aqueduct and this and that it all floods so there that's the one flood story from the from the Aztecs I can remember but I think there are some stories involving flooding in the um, on the on in the upper west coast of the United States. Um, there are other flood stories. So in other, are those yeah. Inuit recorded Yes, stories. exactly. So there are other flood stories that are not that particular story, that Gilgamesh, Hebrew Bible, Quran story. Yeah. How many of you know 1001 Arabian night stories, Shazade, everybody? <laughs> Roughly when, when was it written? Any, any, any guesses? Anybody? A guess? 1,000 years, years ago. Why don't you tell us when exactly it was put to paper? And that, that, that's such a mean question because it's a trick question. This is not the first trick question you've asked me, so I think that's... So I think 1,000 years ago is not, it's not a bad uh, theory. The, 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 the reason why it's a trick question is that because it's actually impossible to say because it's a story collection that's based on tons of oral stories and oral storytelling traditions and oral stories that actually moved from one written frame tale 
collection. You know, there there are these incredible uh, uh, South Asian story collections, or, or even story collections of story collections. The Jatakas uh, and the Panchantatra. Exactly, uh, uh, and many others. And so it's fascinating to see that there was basically sort of a network of stories, and some of these stories sort of travel from one place to another and sort of get repackaged. This particular package was put together first in Baghdad, based on Persian and, and, and South Asian sources, uh, powered by the arrival of paper from, from China. So that's the sort of technology story where the write, paper suddenly made writing much cheaper. And, and that, that arrival of paper, a Chinese invention, really powered the olden, golden age of Arabic letters and made writing more popular, more widespread, which is why these more popular tales of the Thousand and One Nights were written down for the first time. And then they started to travel from there, finally, via Al-Andalus into Europe. Uh, and became, much later, started to be translated into European languages, including French. And got to the French court. But and got to the French court, and they became so, so uh, popular that the French public wanted more and more stories, episodes. more episodes. and more episodes, and the translator ran out of episodes, and people were literally like, you know, throwing stones against his window. So he teamed up with a young Syrian storyteller, and they just added new stories. And some of the most well-known uh, ones of the Arabian Nights, like uh, uh, Ali Baba, they're they're from that uh, uh, from that new edition. So they are also based on Arabic story traditions. But it, this this you know young Syrian storyteller just sort of combined them and added to them. So that's what I find fascinating. That's this, there isn't sort of one source. source text. It keeps evolving, and that's in the spirit of that oral storytelling tradition. What's fascinating is this young boy, sort of the big exotic thing in the French court, brought by this person who wanted to make an impression in the French court with the princesses yeah. uh, and the queen, and they conjure up all of these, yes. sort of season one, season two, season ten. It's like a story out of the Arabian out Nights, you know. Quite amazing. <laughs> you know, I'm having to ra race through 3,000 years of writing, <laughs> so bear with me. Uh, Gutenberg, mm. uh, you know, Gutenberg in many ways sort of uh, did what you do when you go to church and, and, you know, sit outside and confess your sins. But he gave you a certificate, right? <laughs> Which sort of erased all your... It's like in India, if you go and take a, take a dip in the Ganges, yes. you know, you, you, you're done. You, you know, you can go back and do another thousand yes. years of sin. Yeah. So Gutenberg basically sort of took one of these things and... He did. I mean, you're referring to indulgences, right? The, what the Catholic Church sold against money. It's like money. Uh, 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 a, a certificate to, 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 to sort of pay for uh, your, the, your sins. Yeah. Right. And that's how they raised money to build churches, in, in, including St. Peter in Rome. And this is why the, the indulgences sort of proliferated. And Gutenberg, who just assembled the first kind of press, uh, the, 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 well, reinvented the press. We'll talk about that myth that he invented print in a second, maybe. But he certainly realized that that's that's a great. You, it's like printing money. You can use the same certificate and and you know print it a thousand times or ten thousand times. And he sort of flooded the market with them. That was the beginning of print. It's printing money essentially. And he also then challenged the church. Here he was, you know, selling these indulgences, which is really like a certificate. You know, you volunteer. Here's a certificate. You sin. Here's a certificate. And you know, you're not sinning. You, you are accepting these certificates, right, to support the yeah, the, the, the so, festival. And, yeah. and, and also. <laughs> Exactly, yeah, we, we, we give receipts, yeah, sort yeah, of similar yeah. kind of stuff. But he then challenged the church, and the church owned the right yeah. uh, to write the Bible. You know, it's interesting. Um, I'm not sure I would use the word challenge, because he convinced the church to let him print 
Bibles. That's the first long book in black and red. Uh, and and the church, of course, loved these handwritten Bibles, but they were very uh, expensive pr to produce. And and so we're talking about the Bible in Latin. So he his proposition was his value proposition, as we say today, was that he could the same thing more beautiful, more symmetrical, for cheaper. And so this was his first market: Latin Bible, huge, heavy Latin Bibles for you know pe private people wouldn't buy them for, for, for monasteries and convents and churches. Uh, that was his first market. And the, the church initially thought, that's great for us. We, we are in control of this foundational text, the sacred text. The more, the merrier. This is Latin, so the unwashed masses won't you know, get access to it anyway. And, but we can supply our churches and our priests with these, with these Bibles. And so that's how it started. And how did the democratization of access to this yeah. kind of literature. What happened? How did that evolve? Well, it evolved really when people started to translate the Bible and print the Bible in the languages that people could actually understand, like English and German, and that's really the beginning of the Protestant Revolution. So the, it's sort of a story where the church in the beginning thought, we can con this new technology is going to work for us. It's going it, to... It's, it's gonna, uh, uh, you know, support our power over this text, but then it got away from them through these translations, through suddenly everyone was able to purchase, or not everyone, but more people were able to purchase translations of the Bible. They were first, uh, you know, they were outlawed, especially in England, uh, 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 and, and, but you couldn't control this process anymore. So at first the church thought, we, we can control this, and then they, it worked it's, against It's like them. Every, every government thinks that they can get, yes. and then Luther comes in to the picture. Exactly. Right? And, and so sort of says, cocks a snook at them and says, hey. Exactly. And he, at first, you know, he was just an unworldly monk and he, you know... Was he, he an anarchist? Sort of? I, I don't think he was an anarchist. He was just upset about the indulgences and about certain hierarchy, in, you know, the hierarchical church. But he, he wrote this, you know, his theses were, were a letter he wrote in Latin to his to his to his bishop, so you know he followed the chain of command. He and wrote the in Latin, and yeah, the and, and then it was really when some of his friends and associates said, you know, maybe we should you know translate this into German and and print it, and that's when it really when that revolution started, and then it 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 went from there, and Luther became one third of all printed matter at that time in Germany were, were, were works by him. He dominated that early moment of print and, and the church you know, was on the... And who benefited from Luther's who benefited from Luther? I mean, that's a very complicated story. I mean, you could say that, you know, the church had it coming. It was this incredibly hierarchical, you know, institution. Um, uh, you could also describe these days Luther as sort of the first populist. Uh, and people now often make that, I think rightly, that connection to, to our internet where there was an incredible proliferation of, you know, what we would call fake news and crazy stories and it was a pop... It led to incredible wars uh, in Europe, uh, uh, hundreds of years of war. So, you know, it's, it's a somewhat ambiguous legacy, but at the same time, for us, it's also clearly a demo democratization of writing. It started a virtuous cycle of literacy where more and more people were able to read and write, and therefore were able to different forms of literature emerge, different voices entered the literary world and, the, and, and it just changed everything in, in the way that continues today with the internet. So it's an ambiguous thing, but, but uh, in the end, I mean, a lot of people benefited, as a lot of people suffered from it. It's history, it's complicated. And moving forward and going back to Europe, I mean, the first rights issue, the person who sort of protested about his work being copied was a uh, Don Quixote was Cervantes. Yes, yes. You know, it's it's a it's fascinating. I mean, Don Quixote, uh, you know, takes on. I mean, he's a playwright. He's you know, he's a sailor. He's uh, he's a fascinating figure. And he's also an accountant, and he does some fraud. <laughs> yes. Thrown into jail pretty often, it's which is true. where he thinks up his book. It's true. You know, there's more accountants in this book than yep. I realized. I didn't quite. Uh, uh, that. That's a very good point. In any case, um, so he writes the first part, 
of Don Quixote and becomes this bestseller, and immediately there are no copyright protections. There are these, there, 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 there are these unauthorized uh, printings of it, and then someone else starts to write a sequel, and and Don Quixote and uh, Cervantes is doesn't know what to do. He can't stop it, so he decides to write his own sequel. And in that sequel, he sends his hero Don Quixote into a print shop where that unauthorized sequel is being printed, and sort of rail against that new technology of print and that there are no protections. Uh, but but his book his book. Unlike ChatGPT, perhaps, uh, his book is really amazing, and people realize right. that this is the original, yeah. and that was ChatGPT. That's true. It's true. <laughs> it's true. You know, coming to coming to America and your, um, your your great sort of declaration of independence, mm. which was such a seminal a piece of literature here. Tell us a little bit about yeah. that. Yeah, you know, especially now when I look back, um, it fits into this pattern that I saw what I call foundational texts that, you know, out of this weird accounting invention emerge these texts that are sometimes epics, sometimes poetry collection in the, sen in the, in the case of the Chinese tradition, uh, uh, or, or sacred texts uh, um, that, that emerge out of this writing, first writing revolution, and then be, these texts become these touchstones for entire cultures. And, and especially, and among other things, completely change our sense of religion in, to the extent that today I think it's very hard to imagine even a religion in a narrow sense without sacred scripture. But that, that's a crazy connection in some sense that somehow religion and this accounting technology would become completely intertwined. All world religions today have some form of sacred scripture to back it up. And that's kind of a weird thing once you look at it. And so I started to think about that. And also the negative, I mean, in a way, I'm of course a sort of a partisan of literature and I think it's amazing, but you also see the negative sides of these uh, foundational texts where, I, where, where emerges something that I call textual fundamentalism, and you can see that in a religious sense, but you also see that in a political sense because the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution are sort of secular, sacred texts. Uh, you have sort of special priests appointed for life who preside over the interpretation of this text in the Supreme Court. You have an entire country, uh, <laughs> and, and both in a good and a bad sense. So for me, that's one of the big takeaways both from the Declaration of Independence, but also all these other foundational texts that it's really, we, that we live in a world very profoundly shaped by these foundational or sacred uh, or canonical texts and that, that that is an ambivalent thing and that we need to figure out how to deal with that, how to allow flexible forms of interpretation, how to make sure that we don't have sort of always a class of priests who control the process, who control these texts. And so, yeah, I, I, uh, I, I still haven't come down to sort of one solution. I don't think there is one, but it is that pattern that for the last 4,000 years, and increasingly so, we have lived in this world shaped by these foundational texts, religious, secular, and everything in between. So, so in, your, in your research, where did you see the myth becoming history? For example, back home, Ramayana and the Mahabharata, yes. for example, which are foundational texts for mm, us, yes. but pretty much set in the, in the, in the, in the field of of mythology yes. is now seen as history. Yes. So what? what yeah. How does that work? Where, yeah. Where's the bridge? No, I mean I think that's a great point, and I think all of these foundational texts are myths in some sense, and then it it's a question of how. I think that you are this is another way of describing textual fundamentalism to saying this is how it was and, I, and I'm in control of this narrative and I'm going to tell you what this history is and how to read it and how to understand it and it's all locked in. It's an attempt to control the narrative and to, because the, the narrative is often a written text to control the written text, and I think that that that's what we are up up against. And, and what's the difference? I mean, will 
you know, the 10 seasons of Friends uh, 200 years later be seen to be a foundational text. <laughs> it remains to be seen. Uh, uh, what's, what's, what's the difference? I mean, uh, well, I think, I don't think, I mean, the, the, the difference in a way is history that, that these were sort of early adopters. These are, these are the first texts and they have, an, you know, they, people return to them in one way or retell these stories. Uh, and you know, you, you, of course you can say these, there's some, there, there something amazing about them or there's something that in there that explains a lot of things, that satisfies a desire to know, you know where we come from and, and why we are here and provide some kind of a moral code to live by. So, you know, I'm just bouncing that question back, whether that's also true of some of the great contemporary works that you just mentioned. Sure. <laughs> but, but, but in many ways, if you look at, in the Indian context, if you look at a Panchantantra or a yeah. uh, Jataka tales, which is really yes. fables in yes. every sense animal of fables. the word, yeah. animal fable, animistic fables yes. in, in a way, they didn't become foundation. They, uh, they became uh, stuff that you could borrow from yes. because they were so easy to borrow from. Yes. But they didn't become a foundational track, so yeah. say like Gilgamesh yes. or the Ramayana. It's true, and it's interesting because in a way there are tales where sort of they're sort of framed where, where these pre-existing story materials get used by Buddhist traditions and sort of the Buddha is sort of writing himself into these stories, yeah. No, it is, it is, it is different. You know, there is, when I think about how do texts or how do cultural artifacts become foundational, I think of that uh, there's a fantastic uh, play by the contemporary American playwright Anne Washburn called uh, Mr. Burns. Mr. Burns. Uh, do, you, do you know it? Mm. It's, I think it's, it's so great. And so it, it's a post-apocalyptic play in which, you know, after the apocalypse, there are people who are trying to remember a Simpsons episode with Mr. Burns. And then, uh, you know, a hundred years later, uh, there are long, longer stories out of that Simpsons episode and they're traveling players like at Shakespeare's time. And then finally, you know, 200 or 300 years, I haven't read in a while, it becomes a religion. And you can see that just out of an attempt of a group of people to reconstruct a pre-apocalyptic Simpsons episode, you can create an entire culture. And I think in some sense, it, it's, it's an incredible play. And I think it sort of nails that process. And I've, I'm convinced. So I, I don't think it's necessary, even though I just said it sort of is. In the end, I don't think it's an inherent quality. It's just you can give humans any kind of bit of culture and then they will create well, something Would out of George it. Orwell's 1984 become a foundational text given that what he wrote is something that we're seeing uh, happen across the world? Yeah. I mean... Or it, 2001 Space Odyssey. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's, a, it's a good question. I mean, it's, it's too early to tell. I think with Orwell, since it's such a polemical text and it's written, a text sort of written with a particular concern, um, it's a little hard to imagine that completely changing context. Uh, uh, but, you know, if there's anything you can learn from literary history is that out of a need of a cultural moment, you can do almost anything with a text. So uh, I suppose they could. Uh, you, you keep wanting me to predict which text will be a foundational text. I mean, text you know, in it, it's interesting because when you sit in today's day and age, as perhaps the writers did then, I mean, look yeah. at Luther. Yes. He did a letter, not necessarily thinking that the letter would then lead to a whole movement, yes, right. the Lutheran movement. Yes. It was an accident yeah. in construction. Yeah, yeah. It wasn't an intent. Absolutely. And, and in, 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 in the same way, perhaps the first episodes of Friends was an accident. Will it work? Yeah. You know, it's like yeah. when you go to a studio, will it yeah, work? Yeah. And it's no, so difficult to, and everybody wants to create the next Friends. Yes, you know, but it's hard commercial. to do. It's hard to it's engineer. Hard to there are so many yeah. externalities, sure. I suppose. But going back to, coming back to America, and going back in time. Franklin sort of cracked the code. He realized that 
it wasn't just about the declaration in this piece of document, but it was about how do you get the document from place A to place, place B and the postal systems. You yeah, pass. absolutely. I mean, it's interesting. Franklin's so invested as a writer in certain views, but then I think he, he does something that makes him much closer to someone like Steve Jobs or something like that because he starts to realize that he wants to own the network. So he creates newspapers, not just you mean You mean Zuckerberg rather uh, than Steve Jobs. I, I, yeah. Maybe Zuckerberg yeah. is maybe the better example. You're right. Uh, he creates newspapers. He owns newspapers. At the beginning, people thought, we only need one newspaper. Why would you need several newspapers? He realized, oh, you can have several newspapers. But he doesn't just want to own the newspaper. He wants to own paper. So he starts paper mills. And then he wants to control this the distribution. So he becomes postmaster general. So he can send his newspapers for free uh, from Philadelphia to New York. It takes one day. I think it takes more today to send a letter from Philadelphia to New York. So anyway, so this is what he really cares about. Uh, and he doesn't push a pol his political agenda. He allows all kinds of views, including crackpot views. And when he writes, he writes under a pseudonym. So he, it's, it's very interesting. He's much more interested in creating the infrastructure. Uh, uh, and that, that's sort of his genius. It, it's a fascinating story how he looks at this also as profit. And at one mm. point of time, uh, you know, he stole that the, the journey from Philadelphia uh, down to Washington in New York is really problematic and there's no rest houses. So he goes out there and he sets, he sort of sorts it all out. Mm. He sorts out the way that, you know, letter goes from place A to B. But I, you know, we have, I'm going to open it up yeah. shortly, but let's go back to how was paper and printing and all of that invented. China, yeah. Yeah. Uh, a different story in, in, in Arabia in Babylon. Tell us both yeah, yeah, of this. Yeah. No, I mean, it's one of these myths. I mean, I'm not the first one to point it out, that, but Gutenberg is still seen as sort of the inventor of the printing press, and it's just not true. I mean, both paper and print. And one of the big surprises for me was, as I already mentioned, that paper was at least as important as, as print, and more importantly, they're important together because a printing technology only is effective or develops its own potential if you have a, if you, if you have a cheap material. Uh, and so they are both invented in China hundreds of years before Gutenberg. And then something very interesting happens in that these two inventions, which very much go hand in hand and, and do in China, sort of separate. Paper, the knowledge of paper moves to the Arabic world, where, it, as I said, it sort of powers the golden age of Arabic letters, and then moves into Europe via the Arab part of Spain, Al Andalus, and, and, and arrives in northern Europe, just in time when the idea of print, probably it's harder to reconstruct, probably ar arrives via a land route via the Silk Road. Uh, in Northern Europe. And so in a sense, these two inventions reconnect in Northern Europe. And this is what Gutenberg does. And so Gutenberg doesn't invent print. He certainly doesn't invent paper, but he recognizes a potential. And he basically sets up the first sort of assembly belt mass production. He realizes there is something about mass production. And that's, that's really and setting the letters and casting yeah. the letters he, and the thousands of people that he had yeah. to be able to keep up with the uh, what's it called? The certificates? Or, or indulgences. The indulgences. indulgences. I like certificates. Yeah. 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 <laughs> China, staying with China for a second, I mean, again, it was the scribes and the bureaucracy in China that dominated through millennia till very recently where the yeah. same exam is done if yeah. you want to become a bureaucrat. So I, I, you could call them scribes. In China, I mean, in English, translating a Chinese term, they're called literati. But it's, it's interesting because it was, in a sense, the first system of meritocracy that, that was set up in, in some ways to break the power of the military. Uh, so the, this exam system, which is sort of the origin of the SAT and all these you know, testing regimes, yeah, started in China like over a thousand years ago and was meant to recruit bureaucrats. Uh, so your, your favorite scri uh, accountants uh, uh, again. And so that's, that's what happens. So this is, this is a very interesting system where suddenly power accrued to those who knew literature and as a canon of uh, foundational texts, and and that's why the the literati class became such an important and inf influential one over a very long period of time until the end of the 19th century. Yeah. And they, they held the power. 
and, and pushing back against this whole industrialization mm. in many ways was Karl Marx. Mm. Uh, drinking, what, in a pub and discuss. No, it was in a, in a club. He was a playing a nice game called chess. Chess, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and so, yeah, I mean, it's, this is part of the, you know, the, the populist potential of print and uh, I have a chapter on the Communist Manifesto. It's a text I had done previously research on, just because it's, a, it's, it's so interesting how that one text became so dominant, because there are dozens, hundreds of pamphlets like that that were published in the middle of the 19th century. So why did that one text start to dominate and become very important very quickly, changing history for better or for worse? And so that, I think one reason was storytelling, because Marx and Engels didn't just put down a series of theses, they, they tell a big grand story of world history. That's how the, the Communist Manifesto starts. The history of the world is the history of class struggle, and then they tell the history of the world through that lens, and then add to it this new protagonist, they invent a new protagonist, the proletariat, a kind of collective pro protagonist in world history. They kind of conjure that protagonist into being, saying, you know, these disempowered workers, uh, they, aren't, they aren't just victims, they are, they are protagonists in this history. So it was a completely new way of telling the story, and I think that's part of the, uh, 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 the appeal of that text. But I really feel like we should let the audience ask some yeah, questions. Yeah, one last thing before we... <laughs> you, you know, we're, we're going off to Houston and, and mm. later in December, Florida, the two states that ban the yeah. maximum number of books. Why do people, why does literature in the world threaten people in Yeah, power? I mean, in some ways, book banning and book disruption, I mean, it's one of the sort of subterranean through lines of this book too. I mean, it, I guess in an indirect way, in perverse way, it attests to the power of literature that people recognize that power and want to control it, whether by creating institutions of interpretation, you know, a priestly class or some set of group that controls interpretation, or through censorship and destruction. And I mentioned, of course, the, what the Spanish did uh, in the New World, but that's just one of many examples. So it's, it's a, there's a history of censorship and control that runs through the entire history of literature. And literature isn't always on the side of the oppressed, so to speak. We kind of think that since the 19th century, the, the writer is the writer, you know, telling truth to power for the law, and that's true and very moving, but for the most, most of its history, literature was created you know, and written by scribes and accountants and those in power. So there's a very ambiguous uh, and sort of our idea of the writer and the intellectual is very important. It's a very recent invention, which, which, which is interesting. But that's, that's how it would frame the history of, of censorship, and it's uh, you know, disturbing to see it happening in front of our very eyes. Uh, but that Ultimately, this is what it says, that this is important, so people fight over. Romeo and Juliet was recently banned, as you know, I think in Texas or Florida, I can't remember where, as is the diary of Anne Frank and Margaret Atwood's Handmaid's Tale. And in, in many ways, you know, in, in platforms like this, one of the important things is to look at all of the different truths that can coexist and stand together. Yeah. Martin, thank you for this, you. you know, totally brilliant I mean, in, distilled in these pages is really, like I said, 3,000 or 5,000 years of history that you can pick, it, pick and choose at your, own, mm -hmm. uh, at your own time. But questions from the audience? Anybody? Yeah? I find it fascinating. We think of accountants as the first. Uh, can we just wait for the mic because these are all recorded? Thank you. We imagine accountants to be the most boring people out there, but then you <laughs> say that, you know, what we know of the origin of the written word begins with the accountants, and you call that literature. So my question is, how do you define mm. literature? In my mind, it was all—it has always been fiction, but clearly yes. you cover, you know, something like the Declaration of uh, Independence yeah. or history, philosophy. How do you what? define literature? Yeah, it's an excellent question, and one I grappled with a lot. One of the difficulties with a term like fiction is it's a very recent term. This idea of literature as fiction of a certain sort of uh, s status or importance in, in some sense is only a few hundred years old. So you're always in some sense, if you're trying to take a kind of bird's eye view, 
uh, of these things, you're in some ways always, always is the danger of taking a, 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 a rather recent term and sort of projecting it back and then you, you have difficulties, for example, looking at these epics. Are they fiction? Are they fact? Are they wisdom literature? Are they philosophy? What happens when they become sacred texts for certain communities? And so you have this sort of a, a family of uh, 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 terms that we use to make distinctions that weren't necessarily used uh, at the time. So it, this is why I decided in some sense to cast the net very broadly. There are certain things I, I don't really uh, consider part of the purview because I do think a storytelling element is sort of the driving force of it. So a pure code of laws, for example, is not something that I would consider literature in the broader sense. But if it's part of a larger text or a larger framing, as in the Hebrew Bible and many other texts, then I think that that qualifies. So I. Uh, but, but you're absolutely right. It, in today, if you go to a bookstore and look at the, the way in which literature is classified, uh, although it's also interesting that in some books, I actually don't, I haven't checked, I always, it's one of the first things I do uh, is check how people classify literature and sometimes it's fiction or sometimes fiction is distinguished from classics or from literature, which is older fiction uh, and how the genre question, how it's poetry or drama labeled, uh, uh, how is nonfiction and fiction. And so these, these, these classifications, I guess, change over time as everything. And so it's, it's very hard. You're sort of in, uh, caught in a difficult place because you either apply these current uh, distinctions and then you try to look for the equivalent, you know, <coughs> a few hundred years or a few thousand years ago, or you have to kind of cast the net wi more widely. And because that was sort of the exercise I was doing, that was my strategy. But it's, it's an excellent question and there is, no, there is no neat solution in some sense.